upgrades to improve clinician override rates. Rose's current um, research focuses on the improvement of contraceptive care with the use of a patient-centered sexual health decision aid. So with that, Rose, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So let me share my screen here. Right. <clears throat> so thank you everyone for coming to the symposium today. Um, it's entitled Shaping Healthy Sex Choices, the Development and Evaluation of an Interactive Reproductive Health to Patient Decision Aid. So just in the past couple of months, we have seen a transformation in the landscape of women's health. Two Supreme Court rulings, one on abortion services in Louisiana, and another on coverage of contraceptives by the ACA have changed the way people have access to health care. And all of these rulings have an impact understanding and access to sex services. Currently, the cultivation of this understanding has been misinformed or not informed at all within the past 30 years. So we want to know what led us to the point we are at today. And so this timeline will highlight some important moments within the evolution of sexual health education in America. And I'll touch on a few of these points in time. So in 1892, the National Education Association passes a resolution that calls for morals education in schools. This becomes the start of sexual education practice within the United States. In 1918, we see huge spikes in STI, syphilis, and gonorrhea, which causes Congress to commission sexual education for soldiers via the chamberlain Con Act. At the head of this effort was the American Hygiene Association, who showed soldiers what STDs look like on the cell and human level. Other teaching methods like movies provided another way for soldiers to comprehend how their sexual behaviors could cause them to catch STIs. In the 1920s, soldiers' sexual education soon inspired the movement of the curriculum into schools. They started with films like The Gift of Life, which warned about the vices of sexuality. During this time, teachers like Lucy S. Curtis encouraged other teachers to teach these topics with different materials like poetry or English literature. And then in the 30s through the 50s, here we saw a boom in sexual education, where the Office of Education starts to publish materials for teaching sexual health topics. In the next two decades, college campuses also introduce these same materials. And in the 60s and 70s, we then arrive at the resistance to the boom. And here we see sexual education become politicized, where religious conservatives are using their power to enact protests across the country. In the 1980s, the AIDS epidemic hits. And by the mid-1990s, every state has passed mandates for AIDS education. At the same time, conservatives are mobilizing to rebrand sexual education to abstinence education. And specifically in 1996, this rebrand was pushed into law with the Welfare Reform Act. So this law allowed for monies to be given only to abstinence education programs. In the 2000s, several reports like the Waxman Report determined that abstinence education was ineffective and in some cases dishonest. And this left many students with no instruction about most components of sexual health. So where we are today is that we're left with various types of sexual health education that are not enforced. So again, current policies for sexual health education are rooted in an extensive history of sexual health that is dated back to 1892. And some of these outdated policies still control sexual education today. They've now created generations of people with wildly inaccurate information about things like healthy relationships, non-heterosexual relationships, pregnancy, STI and HIV risk, the anatomy of the female and male bodies, and other topics. So more specifically, abstinence-based programs are proven to have adverse effects on young people's sexual health and their behaviors, yet they're still the program of choice for almost 80% of states. So that's about every four and five states. Abstinence-based sexual programs significantly impact things like accurate and complete information about sexual and reproductive health, decision-making about sex and relationships, and even the health needs of racial minorities and LGBTQ plus youth. So to combat the issue of things like abstinence-based education, there were several states who started to change their education policies to, to include something called comprehensive sexual education. And as early as 2002, Sparkman defined it as the addition to abstinence education, 
while also teaching other aspects of sexual health like contraception and disease prevention methods. This definition has now evolved to the Calc 2018 definition where we now use the term comprehensive programs and that's defined as medically accurate information on a variety of topics, approach sexuality from a positive perspective and aiming at enhancing teens abilities, values and skills to internalize and implement healthy behavior. So surprisingly enough, Oregon started this movement in 2009 when they set standards for comprehensive sexual education in schools. And this education included content on things like consent, sexuality and identity, healthy relationships. And in 2016, these standards were pushed forward to start as early as kindergarten. Up to today, the lack of sexual health education has left many young people with little to no accurate information about sexual health. So this can be seen as a potential source of misinformation, but many others exist and are encountered frequently. So the two other sources we'll talk about today are social networks and the internet. So when we talk about social networks, I define it as individuals chosen as trusted sources for the acquisition and verification of information. Research has shown that people are most likely to rely on and trust information given to them by family and friends. So when taking a closer look at it, the sentiments around that information, it's most negative. So as an example, my mom told me not to get pregnant. My mom told me not to get somebody else pregnant. Um, well, what's your so a popular source of sexual health information for young people is the internet due to its accessibility. And types of internet resources do include things like sexual health websites and social networking sites like Facebook and Instagram. Yet many of these sources may be in- Are you at a break time, Will? So the most prevalent kind of internet information young people refer to is pornography, which gives unrealistic expectations about sexual relationships and anatomy. Research does show that most young people find internet information to be accessible, yet unreliable. So we have seen that all of these sources of misinformation can result in negative effects on a person's sexual health and sexual behaviors. So we want to know, is there another source of information that people trust to provide medically accurate information and counsel patients through treatment options? And so the answer may lie within our healthcare providers, particularly those who provide family planning services. So now we ask, are there any existing tools or methods used for sexual health teaching within the clinic that we can leverage? So clinicians are seen as an important resource for young people when accessing sexual and reproductive health services. And currently there are no set strategies for delivering sexual health education in clinic, just ones that focus on overall sexual health. So things like STI prevention. Uh, we only see the delivery of sexual health education when it relates to a clinical problem or when patients feel comfortable enough to ask about it. But patients do expect providers to initiate these conversations about sexual health and they want to have conversations that are non-judgmental. So they see the clinic as a safe space. Over the years, there have been many tools that have been used to convey sexual health messaging to patients, things like pamphlets, websites, text messages. And each of these approaches have shortfalls when it comes to their efficiency in delivering information. So for example, pamphlets and websites need consistent updating and have to hear it for anyone. Text-based services require access to a phone and are limited with the amount of information that you can deliver at once. So patient provider conversations seem to be the best option for those seeking sexual health information from healthcare providers. But we have to know that these conversations are best when patients are prepared and comfortable having these conversations. So today we wanna to look at contraceptive counseling as the current avenue for sexual health education within the clinic. So contraceptive counseling is composed of the following four things. The first is to obtain a clinical and social history. So here we're asking questions about a person's sexual frequency, if they're in a monogamous relationship, if they've ever been on birth control. Then we want to know about providing education about contraceptive options. So here we can present some or all options that can be prescribed to the patient. Note that some patients may already have a method or two that they would want to try, but here we're just giving recommendations based on their clinical and social histories that they gave to us previously. 
The third thing we want to do is form a plan for contraceptive usage. So once the patient has picked a contraceptive, how do we ensure that they will use it on a consistent and efficient basis? And the fourth thing is to obtain assurance of correct usage. So here we verify that the patient's understanding of the method, how it works and when to take it is correct. And this process is typically completed at the initial visit and at any concurrent visits that involve the removal, change, or addition of a contraceptive method. So contraceptive counseling can be seen as a form of shared decision making where patients and clinicians have to work together to find the best fit treatment for the patient. And every time a patient sees a contraceptive or seeks a contraceptive, the patient and provider have to sort through many FDA approved methods to see which one uh oh, that's not good. Okay, that's weird. You guys can still see my screen. I hope um, we can. We can still see the screen with contraceptive counseling on it. Great, thanks. It was giving me some warning about how I'm only a participant, so it seems strange, but I'll continue. So, um, so there's many of these FDA methods that, and we want to see which one is best fit. So many variables have to be considered, including a patient's current medications, sexual behaviors, likeliness for adherence, and most importantly, the decision has to be made by the patient. So how does a patient with little to no accurate sexual knowledge sort through these options? So once, so the, this counseling technique has been researched heavily and shows positive outcomes for things like increased contraceptive use, improvement in the increased use of effective contraceptives or things known as LARCs. So these are long acting reversible contraceptives. So things like the IUD or the implant, which lasts for many years and increased knowledge about contraceptives. But the effects of these methods don't focus heavily on sexual health education. So many clinicians try to touch on the subject when it's relevant but time is a huge barrier to providing proper sexual health education. And one study actually emphasized in the conclusion that general efforts to improve integration of contraceptive counseling into primary care services, in addition to electronic reminders and efficient delivery of contraceptive information are needed. So clearly there's a need to make this process more efficient. So our informatics question is what informatics tools can we leverage to make this experience easier for patients and clinicians? So again, the current issue we have with the concept of counseling is it's non-modification for levels of sexual health knowledge. Current contraceptive decision aids and education materials focus solely on contraceptive options and adherence without assessing or addressing patients' current sexual health behaviors and risks. So one way that we can fix these issues is by providing accessible literate health information. This can be done with the use of patient decision aids and shared decision-making principles. So what are patient decision aids? Well, they're evidence-based tools that help patients become more informed, form realistic expectations, and choose among multiple medically relevant options. Decision aids have many positive outcomes, including reducing anxiety, improving treatment satisfaction, and increasing the perception of making an informed choice. So research already supports the feasibility of patient decision tools for contraceptive discussions, but a majority of these decisions exist within a specific health system. But two are currently available to the public. One is called My Birth Control, which was created by UCSF, and another is called What is the Right Birth Control for Me, which was created by Planned Parenthood. So this is the My Birth Control uh, tool, which was developed by UCSF, and it was used, uh, was made to promote a shared decision-making approach to counseling that is rooted in women's preferences. The tool intends to mimic the contraceptive counseling process. So the decision aid educates users about different aspects of making a contraceptive decision, as we see on the right. And through a series of education modules and questions, like we see on the left, users are required to rank priorities to find best fitting birth control options. The initial pilot test of the decision aid wanted to know whether patients accepted the tool and a majority of study participants, about 96%, found the tool to be acceptable. Planned Parenthood hosts their own contraceptive decision aid in the form of a quiz. And the quiz is similar to the UCSF tool where it takes the user through a series of questions about the patient's values. 
The aide also asked questions about the patient's personal social network's views on using the contraceptive. So if I were exploring hormonal IUD, would your partner feel okay with you using it? Would your family be okay with using it? How about your friends? And it also covers some socioeconomic factors that impact contraceptive choice, like access to health insurance. And so these examples showcase some of the positives in informing decision needs around contraceptive care. Clarifying values and educating users about contraceptive choices showcases what patients can expect before talking to a clinician. But there are issues with some of these decision needs and how they were built. So for the UCSF decision aid, there's an assumed foundation of knowledge patients have to have about their anatomy and assumes only women will use the tool. Uh, this excludes those who may not have enough knowledge to sort through the options or those who identify as female, so they may not feel comfortable using a tool like this. In the Planned Parenthood decision aid, it does, it's very long. It's about 20 to 30 minutes to take it. And this could be due to the redundancy of questions. Um, and it's rarely used within Planned Parenthood. So within the Columbia Willamette area, of the people that I asked about the decision aid, a majority didn't know about it. And of the ones that did, they didn't use it because of the previous reasons. So the question that we have now is how do we fill the gaps of the previously made contraceptive tools while still trying to deliver a quality decision aid? And so we answer this by using a new framework to develop a reproductive health patient decision aid that addresses sexual health behaviors, risks, and contraceptive options. So we will do this by exploring some aims here. So the first aim is a literature review of current contraceptive decision aid effectiveness. So what are the key content and design features needed to address patient and clinician needs? The second is the development phase. So we, here we're developing and refining a prototype. So here we ask what is the optimal information, decision support, and design features that patients and clinicians find meaningful? And the last aim is a pilot and evaluation phase of the prototype. So is the decision aid acceptable to patients and clinicians? And does it improve patient knowledge? And we'll get back to that in a second. Completion of these steps creates a user-centered patient decision aid. So we want to talk about the, about the scope of the decision aid a little bit more, give you an idea of the, its intended use. So the intended audience would be biological females who are seeking a contraceptive. The focus is to give reproductive health education, which is relevant to making a contraceptive choice. And the intended decision-making activity is contraceptive choice, similar to the ones that we saw previously. The testing cohort inclusion criteria are those who are 18 to 24 years old. So that's how we define young people in this study. And they have to have experienced at least one contraceptive counseling visit. We also would like to include clinicians who have experience conducting counseling and can prescribe contraception. So we are excluding patients who are pregnant, and we are doing this because we want to make sure that all options are available to patients, and we're also excluding those who are biological males. So ideally, when making a decision aid, you want to have it written in plain language and consist of the following components, education, values clarification, and some sort of coaching or tailored feedback at the end. And in this decision aid, we hope to do the same. Educate users about reproductive health topics related to choosing a contraceptive. We want to make sure we're clarifying values, attitudes, and beliefs about contraceptives. So this can fit into the misconceptions piece a little bit. Coach users on contraceptive choice and prepare users to talk to clinicians about contraceptives. So in front of you, you'll see the Ottawa Decision Support Framework, which represents the core concepts of decision-making. I've adapted this framework to fit decision-making with contraceptives. So the framework provides a three-step approach, an assessment of patient and provider needs under decisional needs, the creation of decision support, right here, and the evaluation of decision-making processes and outcomes, which is decision quality. In this study, we will use decision aid acceptability and patient knowledge to evaluate the feasibility of the decision aid. So acceptability measures how well a patient comprehends pieces of the decision aid and its overall ability to help with decision making. And knowledge measures the patient's knowledge of all facets of a clinical problem. So within our first aim, we've already set the scope, right, for our study, which was described in previous slides. So the study will start at steering our stakeholders one here and the systematic review. And here we're forming a stakeholder panel. 
And we end with the final storyboards here that will build the first prototype. So again, in AIM-1, we want to identify the appropriate clinical evidence, decision support activities, and decision aid format and design to address patients and clinicians' decision support needs through literature review and a stakeholder panel. So this, again, involves the literature review of current contraceptive decision needs and requires the construction of a stakeholder panel, which consists of patients and clinicians. So the first outcome we have here is a wireframe of the decision aid. So this is simply just, again, some storyboards, we just have visuals of what we'd like the decision aid to look like. It's not interactive here. And our secondary outcome would be a ranking of design features by importance and effectiveness. And so we talked about this literature review in the first aim a little bit, which is to find effective design features for our decision aid. And to complete this objective, we will conduct some sort of systematic review of current literature on mobile or web-based contraceptive decision aids. And this will fall under a current systematic review, which is OHSU-led, um, which is already reviewing contraceptive care, and it's led by Dr. Heidi Nelson. So here we're pulling papers from this current systematic review to use for this aim. In the second aim, we're beginning with an initial prototype here that will be reviewed by the stakeholder panel. We then move into the beta testing phase and end with a user-approved prototype that's ready for clinical evaluation. So again, aim two is simply to develop and refine a prototype. Here we want to require beta testing to gauge the AIDS feasibility. So we want to use a maximum of 16 participants. So this is four rounds of testing with four participants per round. So the testing will either stop at the four rounds or once we reach a point of feedback saturation, which simply means that if I'm getting the same information before I hit the 16 participants, then I'll stop at that number before 16. So we're, we are collecting several types of data here. Qualitative data we're collecting is the, our beta test or semi-structure interviews. So we want to know what are the design features you like the best? Why did you like them? What would it help you with in your contraceptive choice? And some other data is just simply in application comments. So what specifically works or does not work for you in these virtual prototypes? Our qualitative analysis will be a content analysis. We want to know about things like design, things like content. And again, the stakeholder panel will review the first prototype, so that's before beta testing, and the final user-approved prototype, that, which is after beta testing. And our outcome is a user-tested prototype that's ready for the pilot test. So in our last aim, which is our pilot testing and evaluation phase, we want to begin with the clinical pretest to smooth out any issues with the clinical process. And we end with the evaluation data from our patient reported outcome measures, which are given before and or after the decision aid is, is administered. So here we're piloting the prototype to assess its acceptability and its effect on knowledge. Here we want to recruit at least 31 eligible people within a local family planning clinic, and we want to observe at least 80% acceptability and a 10% increase in knowledge. And so these evaluation metrics and sample size calculations were formed by previous studies and a simple power analysis. So again, we intend to recruit at least 31 participants. Here we're collecting some quantitative data on our patient, patient reported outcome data from the question, some questionnaires, and the analysis is just simple statistics. And the qualitative data is semi-structured interviews that occur with clinicians about the decision aid. What helped you within the counseling process with the decision aid and how would you improve on it? And again, this is a content analysis. So here we have the outcome of a patient-centered uh, decision aid prototype. So we do have some limitations with this study. One is uh, Oregon's racial homogeneity. As we all know, Oregon is not the most diverse state. So to mitigate this fact, we want to test within a local family planning clinic because this does bring a lot of socioeconomic diversity within our data set. And we do have a small sample size, which is typical of qualitative or mixed method studies. But to mitigate this fact, we will use the tool and review it and revise it multiple times. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this proposal was submitted to the Health Assessment Labs Doctoral Dissertation Award, and the award does provide 25,000 in doctoral dissertation research. So if the award is won, we can then proceed with building a mobile application to test within the clinic. So the completion of the research will produce a patient-centered decision aid that addresses knowledge gaps, is acceptable to young people, and improves contraceptive knowledge. 
Improved decision making provides the space for improved awareness, improved reproductive health knowledge, and correct use of contraceptives. Wow, that sounded weird. And the correct use of contraceptives. There we go. This can decrease the risk of unintended pregnancies and STDs and also increase STD testing and consistent contraceptive use. And this current work will inform future effectiveness and efficacy studies, with efficacy being the confidence in contraceptive and decision making ability. And of course, I have to say thank you to many people, um, Karen Eden, my advisor, and all the other DMI's faculty, um, Allison Edelman in the OBGYN department, um, Dr. Hoffman at MD Anderson Cancer Center, Planned Parenthood, and Dr. Bernadette at Planned Parenthood, and to all the DMI's fellows, Andrea Lynn and Diane, for helping me out, and anybody else who helped me along the way. And of course, to my funding at the NLM and to the funding for the Contraceptive Care Systematic Review Resources Legacy Fund. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, thank you, um, Rose, uh, for a, an outstanding presentation. At this point now, we'll open it up for questions. So you can, if you would, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself. If we get several questions at once, I'll ask you to use the chat feature to, so that we don't have people talking over each other. I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Rose, this is Chris Alpi. Um, very great talk. And you may have already kind of addressed this a little, but um, in terms of the recruitment and trying to kind of get at the issues of diversity you mentioned, you know, in Oregon and the recruitment, um, do you have any thoughts on kind of if things don't go quite as you would hope? what kind of backup plans might be needed or do you feel pretty confident that it's going to go as you're expecting because you've already kind of done a lot of preliminary work on that yeah so in terms of recruiting i mean it truly depends on the area where you are you know there are some more um at least racial racially diverse areas of oregon than others um at the I picked local family planning clinics because they tend to be more diverse, not only racially, but socioeconomically. Um, if we see a trend where we're not getting the diversity that we want, we can always, you know, stop at some point and try to get another source of um, people. Um, there's also the debate of whether you can use, do they have to be in the clinic necessarily? Could you use some people on the internet? Um, but that also doesn't give you a realistic idea of how it will be used in the clinic. Um, you could also use it at a place like OHSU, but again, that kind of doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't help with the racial diversity, right? Because now we're hopping from a local family planning clinic to a tertiary academic health medical center. So it's, it's hard to navigate. And so we kind of have to pick and choose what we want to do but I, I at that at this point i can't predict i can only kind of just say we have to see which way it goes if that makes sense great thank you So again, I just want to open it up. If anybody has a question, um, feel free to uh, take your mute off and, and pose your question. Hi, Rose. This is Allison Edelman. Thanks so much for such a great presentation. Um, so as a clinician who does this work, and you mentioned this several times, one of the difficulties is always time. And then also for populations that I mean, almost all populations don't have great health literacy, but for populations that we're seeing that need exposure um, also may not have the just general education or ability to interface with electronic or virtual means. And so how are you thinking that that might help those populations? Hmm. 
So just to reiter reiterate your question, you're saying how do we address those who may not be electronically literate with something like a patient decision aid? Correct. Okay. Um, that's a good point. Uh, I think that there are ways to solve that issue. I mean, anything that we have in decision aid form can can be made into a paper based um, decision aid. It's it's not the easiest thing to do, but it's possible. I think, like I was saying before, with things like pamphlets, there is a pro, <laughs> which is that you know anyone can go in and read it. Um, so you do make a good point that you know using something electronic can be difficult for people who are not able to use it. But I think that's something that we'll have to figure out in testing is for and potentially even find those types of people within our beta testing um, who are low literate in um, using electronics. Um, and that will help us with developing this decision aid. You know, how do we make sure that people are able to use this with ease and it doesn't take that much work? Um, so that is a good point that you bring up. And then I think the other one is just time. Like how long, how long do you think something might work well for somebody to get the information to someone the whole time? Yeah, so the Planned Parenthood one, I think the big issue with that one was that it, it took you maybe, I've gone through it multiple times, it takes me anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to use it. I think a reasonable amount of time is about 10 to 15 minutes. Um, and again, it's really the, you re, you weigh the content you want to deliver versus the time, and we have to balance that. So that's something, again, that we have to talk about with their stakeholder panel. You know, if we have a set time, then we have to prioritize what we want to say or what information we want to deliver. If the priority is more of the content and we can flex a little bit on the time, then we can prioritize, you know, the content a little bit more. Um, but there, there are ways of, you know, flexing both. And so I think that in, in a perfect world, if you have, you know, 30 minutes with them in the room and you potentially tell them to come 10 to 15 minutes before, if we could spare 10 minutes for them to sit down with this decision aid and look at it, I think, you know, your time as a clinician will be much more efficient with them in the 30 minutes that you're talking to them. Yeah, I think, um, Alison, I can also speak a little bit to with a breast cancer tool, um, the actual risk screen feet portion of it took, it takes most people about three minutes and the decision aid portion took about three to four minutes for a total experience of around seven minutes. Um, the idea is not necessarily that your conversation may be shorter, but more focused on the topics that they're most interested in, uh, their, mo their most important concerns and questions that they have. So, you know, that's, I, I hear what you're saying about the concern about a technology and B the time of use of the technology. I, the other thing I, I don't have the latest statistics in front of me, but I am getting the sense that most people have, are, are, many are, have smartphones surprisingly. You probably know much more practice in terms of what you see people walking in with, <laughs> but, um, the mobile version of, of decision aids has really taken off. Yeah, I think one of the difficulties about decision aids in family planning clinics and, and low resource settings is just the connectivity. Um, and we even find this just going to the Planned Parenthood in the city in that the internet is not great and it's hard to download things. And so many clinics are like that. And so if you have something that takes a lot of bandwidth, that can be quite difficult and timely too. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think um, just in working on the other decision aid with Karen recently, um, there are decision aids that you can host that don't require internet. So they're just simply hosted on an iPad or on the phone. It's an app that lives on the iPad, so it wouldn't use any internet. So that is something that um, is possible to do. And that does save a lot of resources and time for people. But it does get more difficult with when you're venturing into, you know, putting it on everybody's phone. That's when you do have to, you run into the connectivity issues. You're on mute, Italia. Oh, I still can't hear you. I'll tell you, we, yeah, okay. Now, yeah, I can hear you. Headphones. 
Um, yes. Here we go. My question was about the twenty-five thousand um, dollars, like scholarship or, or thing that you applied for. Mm -hmm. um, it, do you, when do you know the decision on that, and uh, what's your alternative plan if it doesn't if you don't get that one? Yeah. So currently, what I presented to you is the alternative plan. So if we're able to get the 25,000, it'll be used for development costs mostly and also for uh, user testing resources. Uh, that's what the money will go to. Um, and we sh I hopefully will know by November, December. Um, but this is the, the plan right now is to create something on my own that's easy to manage. So wireframes and prototypes can be done with Adobe software. It's accessible to anybody. Um, but if we want a real live mobile application that people can use, um, and that can be used moving forward, then we would have to put some money up for development costs. So that's what mostly it would go to. I see. So you're saying the web or the the app is um, your is your alternate plan if you get that. Yes. Yes. So if everything, if if the grant comes through, then we could create actually create a mobile app that people could download. But currently, we're we're saying that we're not going to get the grant, so we'll just stay at prototypes. So you know, it's interactive; you can click on things, but it won't work like an app, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. I think too, um, this also provides an opportunity for Rose to provide um, to apply for future funding to um, actually create that app, that mobile app and also test it much more broadly than is what is currently. Planned. I think that's also where you would address some of the diversity uh, concerns that I heard uh, mentioned earlier by um, Ms. Alpi. So, um, so it, it gives opportunity for future work. <laughs> yes. Yeah, for sure. Good luck on that. Thank you. Again, I'll just make a call for any additional questions from our audience. Oh, I did actually have another um, another question. I just remembered towards the beginning, you were talking about you know this difficulty with communicating with patients um, in this sort of thing. And I was kind of wondering, how does it work with minors um, who are perhaps at risk of, you know, not knowing what's going on, um, but like their parents' permission to get sexual education from a um, provider? And does the provider tell the parents what occurred, what was said during the session? Like, is that, does that, how does that work? Yeah. So. To my understanding, minors can go to, say, a family planning clinic or to a Planned Parenthood with the, and they don't need their parents' consent to go. So anything that's said within, you know, the, the visit is kept, you know, private. They don't have to tell the, the parents anything. You can go there and get your pills, things like that. And actually in Oregon, you can actually go to the pharmacy and get pills. So you don't even need to go to um, a family planning clinic to get some forms of contraception. So there, there is a, a modicum of, there, there are ways to get it without your parents knowing. Um, but I think the difficulty is that people don't know. Um, and where are they going to look for that information if they're not getting the information in school? And if they're looking for it on the internet, they, don't, they clearly don't think that it's true. And when they're asking their family and friends, they're getting multiple stories about what worked for them, what didn't work for them. It's, it's confusing. So we want to make sure that we're disseminating information that's correct and that can help, if that makes sense. I think too, you should emphasize that in this particular study, we have to find the age group is 18 to 24 for your pilot work. We actually aren't including um, minors at this stage of the research. But also, uh, Dr. Edelman also noted that minors in Oregon can receive contraceptive care without consent of parent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose that would be a challenge, like different 
different um, rules in different areas if uh, they go beyond all of them, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have to have, uh, you can just have a mobile app for every state and have to have special, I don't know, built-in features to handle different laws and stuff. Exactly. Is there someone who would like to ask a question? I think we can turn the mic on you. Okay, so at this point, um, and unless there's another question coming forward, um, I'd like to release the audience except for the committee. So, and uh, if you can stay on just for a few more minutes, we'll just kind of talk about the um, process. I want to personally say outstanding presentation, Rose. There's lots of fabulous comments in the chat that, you know, that you hopefully you can take a look at. Um, so thank you very much for presenting today. Hey Rose, this is